All right, so hi everyone. I'm Catherine Pazella. I'm the Senior Director of Chapter Development at DUIHQ. Really excited to be here for Judicial Process Training Part 2, um, which is a mouthful, but here we go. Um, and so I have dropped a handout in the chat. If you're watching the recording of this afterwards, you should have also received a handout. You'll need that kind of throughout. Um, and we're going to jump right in and talk about what we're going to cover tonight. So learning objectives for part two are to summarize how severity and repetition influence organization response to different cases. We're going to talk about the different steps of a mediation process. We're going to practice writing questions and statements that can be used in mediations. We're going to summarize the judicial board hearing process, identify the rights of accused members in our hearing processes. We're going to summarize the chapter hearing process and then practice developing sanctions related to various types of member behavior. And so last um, we spoke, we left off at part one. Um, so if you're watching this and haven't watched part one yet, make sure you go back and do that because um, this will make a lot more sense. Um, but part one, Owen, if you could help us out, what is the difference between a mediation, a judicial ward hearing, and a chapter hearing? Uh, mostly just the like level of severity. A uh, meeting's kind of just for minor like incidents and then you get to a J board for a little bit more serious things and then chapter hearing all the way, probably the most serious for the most definitely. serious like offenses. Yep. So it definitely goes in that order, right? Mediation can be more of an informal conversation between a member, probably in leadership, whether it's, you know, someone's big brother can be a judicial board member, judicial board chair, president, associate member, educator, like whoever the right person is for that conversation. And you can send them to do it on the judicial board's behalf should be attended by an advisor, should be documented. Um, we'll go through that in a bit. Um, but much more of a check-in, informal, low-level types of misconduct. Then like the next step up, right, then we go to a judicial board hearing process, which is a more formalized hearing meeting um, where they receive like a notice that they're invited to this hearing. They're explaining their rights and participating in the hearing, which we're going to go over in this training. Um, and they get formal outcomes from the chapter. And then a chapter hearing is kind of the same hearing process, but it's held with the entire chapter. Um, and we talked about the difference being the different types of outcomes that the chapter can give. So that's suspension more than three months, expulsion from the chapter and the fraternity, or fines over $100 that aren't outlined in the chapter's bylaws already. So those are kind of the differences. Um, and you kind of touched on this, Owen, but how do severity and repetition help you decide like which method you're going to use? Um, definitely more severe. If it's like something that's severe, you look towards the more like serious thing, like a chapter hearing. And if it keeps going on, then that also is a sign that you should take more serious intervention. Definitely. So we talked about how there's kind of a graph, right? And the more severe something is on a scale of really mild to really, really bad um, or repetitive being the other axis versus like first time offense versus fifth time offense, right? We're going to escalate between like a mediation up to a chapter hearing, depending on kind of those two um, criteria. Perfect, awesome. Okay, so we're gonna start to review the steps that you would use to host a mediation, judicial board hearing or chapter hearing. And we're gonna start with a mediation, obviously and kind of work our way up in severity. So you can follow along in the handout under the header called mediation process, right? And a mediation consists of an invitation to members an informal discussion, a recommended course of action. Ideally, that's by consensus, right? An agreement of everybody having the conversation and then documentation, right? So there definitely should be documentation, um, even though it's a more informal conversation. So some things to remember here, right? Advisors should definitely be present at mediations um, and they should be documented. It's not just like a catch someone in the hallway hey man, it wasn't cool that you didn't do your dishes. Okay, bye, right? It's like, let's sit down, let's talk about it. Let's say I noticed this, that, and the other thing. Are you saying the same thing? Do you agree? Talk it out, you know, have a third party there so it can't become like a he said, he said situation. Um, so that's the value of having an advisor and make sure it's, you know, fair and you're following the process. 
and then also documenting, right? Following up afterwards and saying, thanks for chatting today. Appreciate you being open to hearing this. We talked about how you're going to commit to getting your dishes into the kitchen or the dishwasher. Um, and, you know, hopefully this is a minor issue and won't have to happen again. But you've got something in writing that says, like, we have had this conversation. So then when it does start to escalate, you can put back to that and say, like, well, we've already connected on this issue this many times. Right. And that's why we're escalating it up to a judicial level hearing or something like that. Right. So that's pretty straightforward. Any questions so far? Uh, I guess so by advisor, are you just talking about like someone like on the exec board or like like a chapter advisor, like your judicial oh, okay. board advisor? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take a few minutes to brainstorm some mediate mediation questions and statements that you can use in sample cases. So if you scroll to the header called sample cases on your handout. Um, let's all look at both since it's not a big group. So do one first and then the other, and then read the case and answer the questions that follow on the handout related to that case. I don't want you to create sanctions right now. I really just want you to focus on if this was a situation that was presented to you, how would you go into this conversation? What additional questions would you have? What information would you want to share with this member? And how would you really like structure this conversation? Because this shouldn't be something we're winging, <laughs> right? This should be like, we've thought this out. We have an approach. We have a plan. We have talking points we want to cover. We have questions we want answered. So how would you prep for this mediation conversation if this was the case that you were given? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on that. And then we can share what you guys came up with. Are we doing the first one or are we doing both of them? Let's do both. Okay. I'll give you about five minutes. So plenty of time.
Do you guys need more time? I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm good. Sounds good. So let's look at these together and kind of talk them out. So let's look at the Trevor situation first, right? So we've got sophomore member Trevor missed the last two chapter meetings and big brother orientation training. Chapter leadership knows he was excited to take a little brother this semester. He's not been active in the group chat lately. He hasn't posted on social media in over a week, which is something he usually does every day. And the chapter's attendance policy says that anyone who misses three required events gets an automatic $50 fine. Um, and obviously with two chapter meetings and big brother training being mandatory, he's probably looking at a $50 fine. Um, so how would you approach this situation? Again, no right or wrong answers, just kind of what would your take be? Um, um, I, I would probably reach out to him and just say I'm concerned with you or lack of participation at required events. Like, is there anything going on causing you to miss them? Probably start with that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I, I was going to say, like, I was going to ask if he's okay. Usually a change of behavior usually indicates like stress or like something's happened in his personal life. Um, see if he was okay mentally first before moving on to anything else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, when we have members of the J board or vice president for risk management who are really big rule followers, they're just like, well, the bylaws say $50, he's getting a $50 fine, right? And I think that that is fair to a certain extent, but right, think about the tone that we want to use in these conversations and how we want people to feel as a result of participating in the judicial process, right, we talked about in part one how we don't want it to be punitive, we want it to be about brotherhood and accountability um, and putting the member first and not the, the rules don't have to come first, right, member first, rules second, um, and that doesn't mean we put them aside, but definitely checking in and just getting that context of like, hey, what's going on, right? Because this is unlike you. There's a couple things going on here that are unlike you. It's unlike you not to show up. It's unlike you not to be active in our group message and social media. Like, is everything okay, right? And like getting some understanding of what's going on in their lives. And then you can decide if the $50 fee is warranted, right? If they're just blatantly skipping things and saying, screw that, that's a different story than they've had some major life thing going on where you might make the decision to be a little bit more lenient, right? Okay. Um, what are some other kind of things you would bring up in the situation? Um, I would kind of let him know that, like, what is happening currently with the situation. So, like, if he continues this, what could happen? And if that's something that he is aware of or not, but we want to make sure that he is aware of what is going to happen if he continues this. I love that, right? And, it, and that just follows so nicely from the thought of potentially giving him a pass on it this time, right? If you're going to waive this fee or you're going to come up with an alternative resolution this time, great right but like reaffirming those expectations and what the attendance policy is and your expectations of him being present when he needs to be or at the very least communicating when things come up and get in the way right so maybe he can't be there but he can be more communicative with leadership about what's going on and why he's missing things um, and so you can let him know, like, if this continues, this is what would happen, just so it's, like, super clear. So I love that approach. Anything else? Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Just especially if you're giving them the pass there, you're like, I mean, I can't always give you a pass in the future. We can kind of figure out a plan, to, depending on whatever the issue is, to kind of help with that and maybe move forward and mm -hmm. see if you can change things in the future. Yeah. And I think asking, especially if there is something going on, do you anticipate this being a problem in the future, right? Like th this, we're meeting at this one point in time, maybe the issue he's dealing with is not over, right? And so if it's like something where he's got to get home every weekend to deal with a family situation, maybe he's not back by Sunday night chapter, Monday night chapter, whatever it is, you know, if this is going to be a problem moving forward what can we work out like can we give you a permanent excuse status for a period of time like you know so just working with him and understanding you might kind of still be in the thick of things um and forecasting what the future is going to look like that's great all right how about the second one so stephanos is a junior 
a chapter member sent the judicial board chair a video from Stefano's social media account of him and an unknown male hitting golf balls off the chapter house roof late at night. It appears that Stefano's was coaching the other guy and yelling at him when he didn't hit the ball straight and the two appeared intoxicated. So what approach might you take here? What questions do you have? How would you handle it? I mean, first, probably, this one's probably more like J-boardable because it seems like there'd probably be damage resulting from golf balls off the roof for sure. But definitely, like, I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> what was going through your head? <laughs> How, how'd you manage to get on the roof? Sure. And I agree, right? Depending on what you find out, this might escalate to a J board, depending on all those things, right? But if you were going to approach it with a mediation first to get more information, what, how would you approach it? And like, how, what can, like, following the questions there, right? Like, what concerns do you have about the situation? How would you communicate them using I statements? And what would, what policy violations would you want to point out to him about this? Yeah. Um, yeah, you go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Oh. No, okay, my bad. Oh, but yeah, I was gonna ask, like, what happened? Like, what, like, what was your point of view? Like, what was, like, you said, what was going on through their head? Um, why they did it? Um, they said it was like an unknown person. Um, figure out who that unknown person was. If it was like a pledge or an AM, well, that's obviously not good. Um, but if it was a brother, it's still not good. But um, I feel like the consequences differ based on who that person was. Mm hmm. Definitely. So if this is an associate member and they're getting yelled at when they're not doing it right, right? Like, and they're both having been drinking that night, right? That could be a really bad situation that could escalate to a hazing situation. So you might be having a totally different conversation by the time you learn all that information, right? But the context does matter is the point. So the point of this one is there's, you know, specific there's unspecific and vague things going on here, like the unknown male, um, things like that. And you want to get those details before jumping to conclusions. And that information might help guide you in terms of what approach you take, whether it's mediation, judicial board hearing, chapter hearing, right? Um, any other questions you have about the situation that you'd want to get answered? I mean, definitely who the other guy was. I mean, that's pretty much main thing you need to know. Like, I guess you also need to figure out what if like what damage occurred or I'm sure mm -hmm. there was, would be damage that occurred from that. Yeah. And I was just saying like, what was going on here, right? Like, so I've got this video, right? And we all know that a picture or a video doesn't always necessarily tell the full story or help you have an understanding, right? It gives you this initial impression, but maybe doesn't completely communicate the full story, right? So I just feel like, what are you guys doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Help me understand what I'm looking at here because I have all these concerns, <laughs> but I just want to hear from you. What were you doing? <laughs> like, let's start there, <laughs> right? And have them have the opportunity to say from their side of things, what was going on uh, before you start jumping to conclusions and doling out sanctions and things like that, right? And so when you think about like approaching a mediation, whether it's kind of low level about attendance or something like the Stefano situation that might escalate to something larger, what is the tone that you want to use in a mediation conversation? I would say you probably don't want to be like extremely stern or confrontational just so it makes it easier for them to like kind of talk to you and have a conversation about it and they won't shut down and be like, I didn't do anything, nothing happened. Then you can kind of get more information if you're approaching them in like a more friendly way. Definitely. How do you want to make members feel? Like they're being heard. Um, like what they say matters. Um, something along those lines, yeah. Yeah, I would say, like, they're still a brother, right? That so, like, maybe they did something wrong, right? Maybe they did something that violates a policy, but especially if you're having a mediation, it's not such a big deal that 
we need to ostracize them and make them feel like a terrible human, right? It's about the behavior. It's not about the person. We're not saying that they're an awful human being. We're just saying like, you did something that might violate one of our policies or be an issue. And we just want to check in and see really what happens. We can get a full understanding of the situation. And then we'll decide from there if we even need to keep like talking because it might end up being, oh, there was nothing. Um, but you just don't know until you have the conversation. So I think that's where using the I statements really helps you approach that in that way, right? Like I've noticed that, right? In Trevor's situation, I've noticed you haven't been at chapter and I've been wondering where you are, right? I noticed in the past you post a ton on social media and I haven't seen you on there in a while. You know, that feels unusual to me. Are you okay, right? And so starting out with those I statements instead of, well, you were up on the roof and why were you doing this? And like being accusatory, right? Starting sentences with the I is like, here's what I'm seeing. What are you seeing, right? So if you think about it, if you're a visual learner, right? Take the behavior, separate it from the person sit on the same side of the table and put the behavior out in front of you. So you kind of make a triangle, right? And you're sitting next to your brother. You're both looking at this thing that's in front of you on the table and you're saying, what's going on here, right? So in Stefanos's case, that could be the video. You could both literally just watch the video together and say, we just want to talk about this thing, right? And think about how different that approach is than sitting directly across from somebody. And that feels just like much more confrontational and like straight head on and, you know, like we're already set up like against one another and butting heads versus like sitting on the same side of like a bench or a table or a couch and just having a conversation as brothers and putting what happened kind of out there into the world to look at together and analyze and decide what happened. Right. So that's how we want mediations to go. Um, and again, like a good mediation should be like a valuable conversation that does make the member feel heard but also communicates expectations and like is trying to help them change their behavior to prevent future harm or prevent future issues like attendance issues, things like that, that they're obviously missing out on with the chapter. So any thoughts or questions about mediations? So next, obviously, we're going to talk about the next level up, which is judicial board hearing. Um, and so that can be used again when there's more severe behavior or cases are repetitive um, or if a mediation fails to affect change. Right. So maybe it's still only the second time they've done something, but you've tried to address it and maybe the person they've wronged is not satisfied or they really haven't changed their behavior. You move on to a judicial board hearing. Um, what is very different about a judicial board hearing and a chapter hearing for that matter is that there are very specific steps that have to be followed to do a judicial board hearing correctly. And it's not like make it up as you go and create your own approach. There is a checklist. There is a step-by-step -step list of things you have to do in order for the process to be valid. And if you don't follow it, the whole process could be invalidated and you might have to do it all over again. So it's really important um, that you follow all of the steps. And so if you think about a judicial board process as having three parts, there's the introduction, information discovery and assessment, and then outcomes, right? So if we scroll to the next page of the handout, which I'll show you here, um, what I want you to do is just take a couple minutes and place each of these parts, which are the steps of a judicial board hearing process, place them in, they go in the introduction, they go in the information gathering and assessing phase, or they go basically in the outro with outcomes, right? And so you can go through this on your own handout and you can like highlight, you know, whatever you think the right answer is uh, for each of them. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that and then we'll go over the answers together. So just to clarify, these are not in the right order. While there is a resource for you that has these in the correct order, 
here on your handout, they're not. And I'm asking you to pick the section of the process that they belong in. So obviously it would be a lot to ask you to place all of these in numerical order. I really just want you to understand, does this go at the beginning, in the middle, or the end? Do you need more time? I'm still working on mine a little bit. No worries, take another minute. Andy, how are you doing? Yeah, I think I'm just about done. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Um, so again, we're placing whether these go in the introduction, in the information gathering and assessing phase, or in the outcome and sanctioning and closing part. So starting with the first one, the judicial board chair opens the hearing and does introductions. Where does that go? Intro. Definitely. All right. Judicial board can ask any final questions. I would say like outro, but the end of the informational section. Yep. It's kind of a shift between the end of the information gathering, right? It's like you've heard everything. What last questions do you have about the information you've heard before we shift on to kind of finalizing everything and wrapping up the hearing? Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of a trick one. All right, the decision is delivered in writing to the defendant. Uh, outro. Yep. 
Judicial Board Chair reviews the procedures, then dismisses witnesses to another room. I'd say info. Yeah. I heard like info. The, yeah, like kind of the beginning. Yep. Yeah, so this would be either be the end of the intro or beginning of the info, right? And so once we've kind of opened the hearing, we're going to go through everything. We're going to tell everybody that's participating kind of what's our agenda, like how is this going to go? And then we're going to dismiss everybody to a different area. If you're on Zoom, you can put them in a waiting room. If you're in person, you can put them in another physical room and then call people in one at a time to talk to the J board. Okay. If the defendant pleads not in violation, then the complainant presents their case. Uh, info. info. Definitely. Yeah. Panel members ask questions of the complainant. The defendant will be allowed to cross-examine the complainant. Info. Yeah. The defendant presents their case. Info. Info. Yep. Yeah. Summary statements can be offered by each of the complainant and the defendant info as well but kind of the end of it yeah yep definitely the judicial board chair reads the charges said intro intro yeah yep necessary witnesses can be called panel members can question witnesses and offer their perspective the complainant and defendant can question and cross-examine witnesses info, info. Mm -hmm. judicial board chat Judicial board chair, I think that's supposed to say, reads a purpose statement, a privilege statement, and an honesty statement. Intro. Yep. Defendant indicates whether they feel they are responsible for the charges. Info. Info. Beginning. Yep. yep. Judicial board chair asks the member if they are being assisted by an advisor, if they believe someone should not serve on the panel, and if they believe the panel should not review the case at all. Intro. Info, but like the beginning as well. Yep. Yeah. I'd say intro um, would be where we'd want to do that. Um, just like it's kind of like getting our ducks in a row. Do you have an advisor? Are there any like conflicts of interest on this panel? Like maybe somebody involved in the incident is on the J board and they say, well, I don't think it's fair that that person's serving on my case because they did something do. Right. So that's kind of like the just getting organized part. Panel members ask questions of the defendant. The complainant is allowed to cross-examine the defendant. Uh, info. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The notification of judicial action form is presented to the judicial chair. Intro. 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 Yeah, kind of sets up the case. Like, why are we here kind of thing, right? Like, what's the allegation letter that's been sent to this member? All right. The judicial board dismisses all witnesses, the complainant and defendant. The board adjourns and determines responsibility and possible sanctions. Outro. Yep. And then appeals may be made in writing and must be received within 72 hours of the decision. Outro. Outro. That's right. Awesome. Um, any questions about, about that? No. Okay. So obviously these are placed in numerical order in a checklist that's available online in the resources section of the DU website under the Vice President for Risk Management tab. So if you're hosting a judicial board hearing, it would be great to like pull this up on someone's laptop or print it out and literally go through and check them off. This is a great thing for an advisor to do in a hearing as well. Um, we haven't talked about how advisors should also be present at judicial board hearings, but they should be. And it's a great thing for them to do is be the person that makes sure that you're following the process. So again, it doesn't have to be redone if it's accidentally done wrong. Um, and so I used to do that when I sat in J board hearings, I would just sit there with the process obviously let my J board chair run it and facilitate the whole conversation, but I would, you know, almost like kind of run my finger down the page and help them. I'd sit next to them and be like, okay, like you're on this part right now, like say this thing, right? And I would help guide them so they wouldn't forget any steps. So that's a great role for either someone else on your J board to play or an advisor in the situation to keep you on track. Um, and you likely noticed in there somewhere was something about how the judicial board is supposed to review the rights of the accused member um, before the process happens. And so I want to review what those are, um, which are on the next page here, right? So 
any member of the chapter charged with violating any chapter rules as entitled to written notice at least 72 hours prior to the hearing. So in advance, they need to know exactly what it is they're being accused of doing. So they have a bit of time to wrap their brain around it and prepare what they wanna say on their own behalf. Um, and so that's gonna be sent in writing. That's not gonna be, again, something you just catch them in the hallway or <laughs> see them in the change of classes on campus and be like, hey, we're having a J board in three days, <laughs> right? It's like, we're sending this over email um, or like texting them a PDF of a letter or something like that. Um, and that notice should include the time, date and location of the hearing, even if that's a virtual meeting, it could have like the Zoom link right in it. They should be notified that they are um, allowed to be accompanied by an advisor of their choice. And in this case, the word advisor does not necessarily mean like a volunteer chapter advisor. It means just anyone they want to bring that is kind of their support person in the process. So that could be another member, it could be an associate member, it could be their big, you know, it could be anyone that they want to have with them in the hearing. They should be informed that they do have the right to present witnesses or if there are other people that have information about the situation, those people can come in person to speak on their behalf or they could present like a written um, testimony kind of thing. If they're not able to be there in person, they could write a statement. The right to an expeditious hearing. So while we're gonna give them at least three days notice, we're not gonna drag it out for three weeks, right? We're gonna schedule it in a reasonable amount of time related to when the thing happened. So they can just be dealt with and moving on. Um, I think when things get carried on for too long, you like lose the educational moment, right? So the thing that happened is so far in the rearview mirror, like you both really don't even remember sometimes, like why are we even having a hearing, right? So deal with it quickly so that you can like capitalize on that moment and move on. They do have the right to refuse to answer questions. Um, they do have the right to know who is bringing the charge and the right to appeal. Any questions about that? So finally, let's talk about the last of the three methods, the chapter hearing, right? So chapter hearings obviously are much more like the judicial process hearing that we just talked about. They're more like that than a mediation. They also have very strict parameters that must be followed. They also include notice and all these rights of the members and everything. It's basically like a judicial board hearing on steroids or we're escalating it to the chapter level, but we're essentially following the same process with a couple of exceptions we're gonna go through. Um, so again, if this process is not run correctly, the whole chapter will have to get back together and redo the hearing, which obviously no one's gonna wanna do. So it's very important that you follow them in the right way the first time. So I'm going to kind of scroll to the next part of our handout here and just give you a minute to read this um, and ask you just kind of make it like, what do you notice about this versus what we just talked about with judicial board hearings? What's different in the chapter hearing process? So I'll just give you a couple minutes to read that to yourself and think about like what makes a chapter hearing different.
All right. What did you notice that's different with the chapter hearing process from a judicial hearing? Um, I said you have to give more notice. Um, and then you're directly presenting to the chapter as a whole, as opposed to just the J board. Um, and then there's a direct vote, like from the chapter. And I know like the uh, suspensions majority and then expulsions two thirds. And then instead of appealing, like you appeal all the way to uh, HQ mm -hmm. and then they make kind of the final decision. Yeah. Um, Addy, did you notice anything else that's different? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't said here, but I feel like um, when it goes to a chapter hearing, um, what happened is a lot more serious than something that would necessarily go to a J board. Definitely. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, what do you guys notice about those middle bullets about the voting? Um, just kind of, there's kind of different tiers, like, well, you, you first vote whether or not the case is actually going to go to the chapter hearing. And then there's like the two different, if it's majority, it's the, just the suspension. If it's two thirds, it's just expulsion as a whole. Yeah. So in some ways it's similar to a judicial board and in other ways, there's a nuanced difference here. So I just want to highlight this for a second. We don't have hearings with predetermined outcomes, right? The point of the hearing is to first establish the facts, whether it's judicial board hearing or chapter hearing, right? We really just want to, again, like a mediation, just talk about what happened. You know, we'll share the report we got as a chapter. That's kind of what you guys' role is as the J board, right? You share what you guys have been told, allow the member or the members to respond on their behalf, to share their side of the story, present any witnesses, you know, ask questions. So the first step in any of these processes is like, get the information right, right? Like, let's get a collective understanding about what actually happened. Then we decide, does this violate a policy? So in the judicial hearing process, we call that the finding of responsibility. And that's where we talked about last time that we use the preponderance of the evidence standard where it's 50% plus a feather or just plus a little bit that's gonna tip the scales. It's more likely than not that they did something or did not do something, right? And so that's your finding of responsibility. If there is no finding of responsibility, as in we said, we do not think you're responsible for violating this policy, that's where it stops, right? Then there's no sanctions. So sometimes where I have to send cases back that I review is there's no finding of responsibility, but there's sanctions. And that doesn't make any sense, right? Because if you're saying you didn't violate any policies, why are you giving them sanctions, <laughs> right? So that should be a red flag in your process of like, if you have an inclination to give sanctions, you're probably saying to yourself, he's responsible. At the chapter level, the finding of responsibility is called whether cause exists or not, right? Did, is there cause to give sanctions? We're essentially asking the same question. We're just asking it a little bit differently, right? Saying there's no cause means the chapter as a whole does not think this person violated a policy and should have any outcomes from the chapter. So again, if that majority vote fails and the chapter says cause does not exist to hear this case, that's where it stops, right? So that's again where I would send a case back is if the chapter that first vote says no cause exists, but then you take a second vote, it's like, no, 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 it died. It died on the first vote. Um, but if the answer to the first vote is yes, there is cause to hear the case, that's when then the chapter deliberates on, okay, so basically we found this person responsible, what are gonna be the outcomes of that finding of responsibility? or the finding that cause existed. So that's when they move on to talking about, is this, we're suspending somebody, we're expelling somebody, or we're fining them more than, right, we're suspending more than three months, we're fining more than $100, or we're permanently expelling them from the fraternity. Um, so you can see why it's so important, right? If you can permanently expel someone from Delta Youth Salon, it's really important that you follow this process to a T, 
Because if you don't, they can come back and say they didn't get their due process, they did not get the rights that were afforded to them, and therefore, like, it was a totally, it was a sham, right? And that's where I'm going to say, like, I'm sorry, but your chapter has to redo this and make sure you follow the steps and give them all of their due process. So in when they vote on sanctions, right, there's no threshold for the fine over $100. You can use a majority vote for that. If you're doing suspension, it's in the fraternity's governing documents. It has to be by a majority of members present, and it can't exceed a year. Because if you're suspending somebody for more than a year, you probably are trying to expel them, right? Um, suspension is supposed to be for a short period of time. It means that they can come back. But if it's going to be longer than a year, you probably have the inclination they probably just shouldn't be around, and then we should probably be talking about expulsion. And because expulsion is permanent and it's really serious, obviously we need that two thirds vote of people present. And so um, you wanna make sure that you are counting correctly and recording that in the minutes that are your official record of this that you need to turn in when you submit the status change on your roster. And it's two thirds vote of members present for something to pass. So essentially an abstention is a no, right? A lot of chapters will say, you know, all those in favor say aye, any opposed say nay, how many are abstaining? And it's like, well, the abstentions are not yeses, right? They might not be no's, but they're not yeses. And what you're really trying to count is yeses. And do you have two thirds or do you have a majority, depending on what you're doing, of yeses? Anything else is kind of irrelevant. Does that make sense? All right. So that's, that middle section is where most chapters get tripped up and where we have to send paperwork back. So I just wanted to really kind of go over that, that you're doing a two-step vote at a chapter hearing um, to do that process correctly. And like I said, you do need to record it um, in your chapter minutes. There needs to be complete minutes of like who said what, you know, what the discussion was, ultimately what the vote was, right? How many members were present, how many voted in favor of cause existing, how many were opposed or abstained. And then when you move on to the outcome, how many voted to suspend or expel or fine or whatever you're doing versus nay or abstain. So we have clear record that it happened. And that's what you'll submit when you do your roster update in the DU portal, you'll actually send in that paperwork. And then yes, the appeal does go to headquarters and like the written appeal comes headquarters kind of through me. And then it ultimately is heard by the assembly of trustees at the next leadership institute the next summer. So they do have to wait all the way till the next summer, regardless of when it happens. So any questions about that? Okay. Finally, I wanna wrap up by talking about sanctioning. Um, so when it comes to sanctioning, Obviously, we want to remember what the whole purpose of our process is in general, right? We want to reiterate accountability within the chapter. We want to reinforce brotherhood. Um, and we want to re-educate re on policy and reinforce expectations. So all of your sanctioning should be in line with that. None of it should be punitive just for the sake of punishing somebody. Um, it should be directly tied to what they did, right? Um we don't wanna punish people just cause we like getting people in trouble or we have the power to do that by virtue of being on the J board. We want to design sanctions that actually change behavior for the better. Um, and it's also important to stay consistent from one case to another. And some chapters accomplish that by having a sanctioning matrix that lays out right in your governing documents. If you do this, then this happens. And one example of that is what we shared at the beginning with the case about Trevor missing things, right? You could have an attendance policy that says, if you miss this many things, you get a $50 fine or whatever the fine is, right? And so there might be some set outcomes that your chapter already has in place in a matrix like that. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, and so if we scroll down together to the St. Stroning matrix on our handout, um, I want you just to quickly take a stab at some potential outcomes for some of these issues. Maybe if you each pick three randomly um, and write what a potential appropriate outcome would be for that 
situation, um, then we'll talk about it. Right. And we want to make sure we're giving sanctions that match that philosophy that I just talked about, about reinforcing brotherhood and accountability and being educational, not punitive. If you know your chapter has a sanctioning matrix, you can pull things from that. Um, but if you don't, you can just make stuff up right now. So I'll just give you a couple minutes. I'll just give you another minute. All right, was this easy, medium, or hard? I think it was pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. Great. Love it. Not trying to trick you or make you think too hard on a Tuesday, but it's good to practice. Um, so what, what are some things that you came up with? Um, for the first one, uh, for disrespect towards another brother, I put down apology to brother and either community service and social probation on top of that. Okay. Great. How do you think that? um increases accountability or brotherhood in the chapter well i feel like most disrespect to any other brother kind of occurs in a social setting where people are either intoxicated or you know um just under the influence so i feel like that social probation will kind of help them get that in check and the apology to brother i feel like that's just like to like reinstate brotherhood you know make sure you are good with your brother you know mm -hmm. definitely yeah. oh and what's one that you came up with uh, for the disrespect one or for any of them um for for the dues uh i said social probation because i mean usually a lot of guys who are not willing to pay dues if they're not going to go to socials they're either going to pay their dues or they're going to just drop so that's kind of the way we but sometimes we'll talk to them and see like if they have an issue like what the issue is with the dues or why they can't pay them but Generally, you're either going to pay them or you're not and then drop. So that's kind of what we do. How does that help increase accountability and brotherhood? Um, it kind of just makes sure, I don't know, it, it just you just kind of have to police guys, make sure they're paying their dues. They can't really be going to like social events like that if they're not staying on top of their like responsibility towards the chapter. Yeah, like the dues pay for the social events. Right? Yeah, not like, really fair to the other. If you're not people. paying into the pool. You shouldn't be able to benefit from the events that we're hosting until you've paid your fair share, right? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Do you have any questions about sanctioning? All right, advisors should be involved in sanctioning, like I said, and then you've got a bit of a kind of key here, right? So with JBoard, they can do fines less than 100. You can suspend for less than three months. You can have probation with or without restrictions, right? That might be a social probation. It might be an activity probation, like you can't participate in homecoming or whatnot. Um, you can utilize behavioral contracts, 
um, that might help in like a failure to pay your dues situation, right? You can sort of have a payment plan with them, give that to your vice president for finance, all right? That could be a nice gift from the chain board. Um, here, we took care of this for you. Um, if you are a housed chapter, you can work with your house corporation to deal with house related issues that are listed there, like um, damage to property, you know, ending someone's lease, things like that. But the J board on their own cannot like terminate a lease. You have to work in concert with the house corporation because they are the landlord. Um, it's not the chapter. Um, and you can restrict access to the property um permanently or just maybe during certain hours or certain types of events but you have to work with the house corporation for that and then you can um have you know the chapter hearing process can give you fines of a hundred dollars or more suspend for between three months and a year and expel from the fraternity like we talked about earlier uh, I think the thing about a sanctioned matrix, if you were to create one, um, is you still do have the right, the, while the purpose of them is to have fairness and consistency between cases, the J board still does have the right to flex the situation, right? Because every case is different. We want to treat every individual like an individual and make sure that they feel heard and that the outcome is appropriate for their particular situation, that's fine. You just have to be able to defend that choice, right? So there has to be a reasonable explanation for why you varied from what the standard is that the chapter approved. Um, because ultimately like the chapter has voted on that matrix and said like, this is what we feel like are fair fines or punishments or whatever. So if you are deviating from that, you should be able to defend that you know, if someone were to call you on it, you would want to make sure that you have a reason for why you've done that. I'm also happy to review sanction matrices. If you've got one as a chapter, you want my opinion on it, happy to do that, happy to share, you know, ideas from other chapters. And then the last thing about them is you can also make sanction matrices about different topics, right? So you could have one that's just about attendance and like first, second, third offense. You can have one that's about substance-free housing violations, right? That one you might want to do in conjunction with your house corporation because um, ultimately like multiple violations might end in like the, their lease being terminated, right? So you can have, it doesn't have to be like one giant matrix for any possible like thing that could happen in your chapter. You can have these like small matrices for like, you know, alcohol violations, physical violence, substance rehousing, you know, all these different types of things. Okay. So obviously remember you can use your judicial board for more than just hearing cases, right? During part one, we talked about how there's other roles and functions the J board plays. Um, so generally it should be a standing committee that's meeting weekly, that's doing things like creating sanctioning matrices and talking about the rules. And do we want to propose changes to the bylaws because we're seeing a lot of members struggle with this particular thing. So maybe we need to reevaluate this policy. Um, but generally they should be a standing committee that regularly is thinking about how they can increase brotherhood and accountability within the chapter and help people follow the rules so that everybody can have a good experience. Um, and any activities that achieve those goals can be the work of the J board. So let's wrap up. Uh, would you each mind sharing a takeaway from today? Um, I thought the like hearing process was definitely pretty important, especially like, I mean, well, especially if you're going for an expulsion of the chapter, how, important it is to make sure you actually iron down all the steps for sure to make sure there's no like way that it can be thrown out so I awesome. think that's definitely something important that I will look into definitely make sure it's ironed down if that ever happens sounds good Andy yeah um a good takeaway for me was like I guess I didn't know like how much thought kind of went into like a J board hearing and also a chapter hearing process as well. Um, it was pretty enlightening to learn about all that just to make sure like we're all on the same page. Everyone's getting like the best treatment possible. Definitely. Yeah, when done right, these are really valuable processes, right? When they're not necessarily given as much time or intention, right? They can feel punitive or they can 
just kind of get bungled and like not be effective. But if you really put some thought into what you're doing and think about the importance of kind of like you being the guardians of brotherhood and accountability in the chapter, it really just shifts the mindset and changes the way that you approach the work. So that I, that's what I would encourage you both to do. Definitely appreciate you being with me tonight, sticking with it. Um, I'm putting the post test in the chat. Once you've copied that out to take it, feel free to go. If you have individual questions and want to stay, I will stop the recording and we can just chat for a while. Um, but just want to say thank you so much for being here and have a great night. See you guys. Thank you.